So it is nine o'clock uh, Pacific time. So I'd love to start um, our quarterly webinar. This is Ariana Longley, Vice President of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And we are very excited to have our expert presenter, Dr. David LaGru, who's Executive Medi Medical Director of Southern California Providence St. Joseph's Health System. Um, so our topic uh, this quarter is optimizing obstetric safety and reducing unnecessary C-sections. Um, so uh, uh, looking through on the agenda, um, it's a one-hour webinar today. The first 10 minutes, um, I will give an overview about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and the actionable patient safety solutions or apps that we have created. Um, we will then switch over for 35 minutes of a presentation um, that Dr. David LaGru has put together, and then we will have 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Um, so. Uh, Zero by 2020, that is the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's mission. We believe that one preventable patient death is truly one too many. And so we set this goal um, knowing that initially we were going to be you know, working through um, inside of the United States and really started spreading across the world and now are a global movement. Um, we believe that we can achieve that goal of zero preventable deaths by 2020 by fostering new efforts and building on existing patient safety programs through commitments to zero. So we're truly a commitments-based organization, not a membership-based organ organization that believes in shared learning. And so there are a few groups who can take take action with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, we truly want these commitments to span um, not only state counties and states um, and, uh, and countries, we want to, to spread across the world. So there are four groups that can take action. Hospitals and healthcare organizations can make a formal commitment around what they're doing to improve patient safety. Um, at this time, we have over 3,500 hospitals across 43 countries who have shared these public commitments. Um, please take a look, if you have not already, on our website and see which local hospitals around you have made a commitment and what other institutions yours um, might be able to learn from. Um, the second group are committed partners, and these are nonprofits, associations, um, professional societies, advocacy groups, and they can be part of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation connecting the dots. Uh, we know that there are so many groups out there focused on patient safety. We want to break down those silos and encourage ways for those groups to work with us. Um, so they sign commitment to action letters, um, which basically details how they will participate in the movement, sharing our mission of zero by 2020, and um, also, uh, you know, um, joining with us in our mission. So a few examples of those committed partners that we have are the American Society of Anesthesiology, um, the South Carolina Hospital Association, the Emily Jerry Foundation, um, the Global Sepsis Alliance, uh, just to name a few. We have over 30 of those to date and uh, gaining more every day. The third group are healthcare technology companies. And this is, I, I believe, what sets us apart from a lot of the other organizations out there. Um, because our foundation was founded by Joe Chiani, who's also the CEO and founder of Massimo, um, there was a, a strong connection to ensuring that data is openly shared um, without interference or charge. And so we encourage healthcare technology companies to sign what we call the Open Data Pledge, which encourages shared um, data uh, to give clinicians a better picture of their patient and then hopefully um, also allow patients to view their own data. Um, companies who have joined, for example, are Philips and GE, Welch Allen, Cerner, IBM Watson, just to name a few. The fourth group are patients and family advocates. We believe strongly that patient stories can really fuel um, change and inspire change in health systems and across the healthcare ecosystem. We have over 50 stories of people who have either survived instances of harm or have uh, lost a loved one preventably in the hospital. And so you can view those on our website. You, we also um, will film a select number of those every year and uh, we have about 15 of those available on YouTube that um, anyone can use. They also, we also offer other resources 
um, for patients and family members um, to have a better experience in the hospital. And uh, earlier this year, we released a mobile app for patient use called Patient Eater. Um, so that's free to download from the Apple or Android um, Google Play Store. So talking about actionable patient safety solutions, um, this is kind of our core product. Um, they're free to download, um, so please go to patientsafetymovement.org slash apps to take a look at these. But every year since uh, the inception of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we've rolled out new challenges that we believe have actionable solutions to help solve. And so these are a select, uh, or these are the, the full listing of all of our actionable patient safety solutions. Um, the, four, the three in the bottom right that are highlighted are three of the new challenges that at our mid-year planning meeting uh, we voted on as, uh, as challenges that we would focus on in 2018. So that's falls and fall prevention, nasogastric feeding and drainage tube placement and verification, and person and family engagement. Um, today, obviously, we're going to be talking about apps number 11, optimizing obstetric safety. So just, uh, you know, again, to, to reiterate the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's goal, we believe that zero um, is the only acceptable goal. And in order to do that, we have to track how many lives are being saved through the um, hospitals who are participating in the patient safety movement. When we launched in 2013, we announced 60 lives saved. In 2014, we announced 600. In 2015, um, you can see on the screen that we announced 6,571. In 2016, that quadrupled up to 24,643. And last year, we announced 69,519. So in order for us to, to really stay on track um, to 2020, we um, hope to announce in 2018 at our summit that we have been able to save 150,000 lives through the work of um, all of the committed groups that, uh, all of the committed hospitals who work with us. So with that um, and a little bit of the introduction about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, I would love to pass it over to Dr. David LaGrew. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Dr. LaGrew, he's a maternal fetal medicine specialist and physician informaticist with a special interest in maternal quality improvement. After growing up in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, where he completed his medical school and residency at the University of Kentucky, he began computer programming as an undergraduate student and earned an extra income during undergraduate and medical school. He came to Southern California to complete his maternal fetal medicine fellowship at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center and uh, University of California, Irvine. And following that fellowship, he joined the faculty at University of Louisville before returning to become the medical director at the just opened Saddleback's Women's Hospital in 1988, the first labor delivery and recovery unit on the West Coast. And he developed techniques for providing obstetrical care via the collaborative practice model. Um, and that hospital was a pioneer for cesarean section reduction, emergent cesarean section drills, maternal quality improvement in techni techniques such as controlling unnecessary inductions and episiotomies. Um, Dr. LeGru currently is a member of the executive committees of the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, CMQCC, and California Maternal Data Center. He co-chairs the CMQCC Hemorrhage and Intended Vaginal Birth Task Force and co-edited the CMQCC Hemorrhage and Primary Cesarean Section Reduction Toolkits. Um, he also participates on national committees, including the ACOG Revitalized Conference for Obstetrical Terms, AIM Task Force for Obstetrical Hemorrhage, and co-chaired the AIM Task Force on Primary Section Reduction. Um, in 2013, he was appointed by the Executive Committee of the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine to chair a special task force involving the major obstetrical provider groups on the Maternal Health Information Initiative to help achieve consensus on informational needs going forward. He's worked on numerous national perinatal quality initiatives with focuses on C-section rates, maternal hemorrhage, elective deliveries, working with organizations like IHI, ACOG, SMFM, and CMQCC. He's the president-elect of the Pacific Coast Obstetrical and Gyneolo Gynecological Society, and he co-chairs the AIM Safety Bundle Task Force on increasing chances for intended vaginal deliveries and CMQCC toolkit development for the same subject. In October 2016, he accepted the position of Executive Medical Director of Women's Service for the St. Joseph Hogue Health Region of Providence Healthcare, and he's been charged with developing the Individual Ministries Clinical Institutes and in Systematizing Women's Health. 
So with that, Dr. LeGru, we welcome you and thank you for your time today and look forward to your presentation. Wow, thanks, Ariana. So uh, today I would like to focus on <clears throat> one of the uh, obstetrical uh, safety issues, uh, uh, a new uh, look at how we can reduce cesarean section and why this is a long-term strategy to reducing uh, maternal mortality. Um, I, I think when people look at uh, the safety of pregnancy and the, the relative uh, low numbers of mothers that actually pass away, uh, we really sort of pat ourselves on the back and I won't say ignore this problem, but I will say that for most people, uh, when you uh, initially talk about this, they think actually we're doing really well. And part of that's uh, realistic, as I'll show you, and part of it, unfortunately, is not realistic. Um, today, when we talk, we're really gonna be focused on pregnancy-related deaths. Um, there, there's a lot of different, unfortunately, a lot of different terminology that people have used over the years uh, pregnancy deaths during a pregnancy are, are typically broken down between associated deaths that mean everything that happens within a year and pregnancy related, those things that are a direct complication of the pregnancy or an aggravation of an existing problem or just a chain of events are initiated by the pregnancy itself. So obviously a lot of the a lot of the safety uh, movement uh, techniques that are listed outside of our obstetrical domain would affect uh, associated deaths, but we're really focused on those that are related directly to uh, pregnancy. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Now, one of the aspects of why people get the idea that we're doing so well initially is, is this curve. If you go back to the 1900s, uh, and look uh, well before prenatal care or antibiotics or blood transfusion and looked at the number of moms who passed away during pregnancy, you can see it was 800, uh, 900 uh, per 100,000 deliveries, meaning eight or nine percent. And really, by, if you look on, uh, you know, at, by 1990, we had gotten this down essentially not to zero, as I'll show you, uh, but gotten it way down from this uh, initial number. And similarly, if you compare uh, here in the United States to the rest of the world, we tend to think of maternal mortality as something that hits sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and, and other areas where there's limited uh, obstetrical care and facilities to take care of moms. Uh, in the developed uh, nations, our uh, rates are pretty low. So again, when you look at this, you think we're doing pretty good, except really when you really begin to look closer. And that's like, uh, that's what I would like to, to share with you now. So what we noticed in, here in California, and again in the United States, is that our uh, maternal mortality rate sort of bottomed out in the middle of the 1990s uh, and really approached the, the single di digit numbers of uh, seven, eight, nine per 100,000. Uh, but then what we noticed after the turn of the century is that this slowly began uh, increasing. And so uh, the 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 sort of bottom line was we went from a single digit number to a double digit number. This, by the way, 2006, where this graph ends, is precisely where we formed the, the California maternal, uh, uh, the California, uh, the CMQCC, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, because we wanted to address this, this doubling of the maternal mortality rate. And of course, whenever you notice something bad going on, the first response people have is, wait a second, have some, has something changed with the numbers? For example, when you look at maternal mortality, there were changes to the birth certificate that uh, a checkbox that literally says, is this, was this patient pregnant? 
within the last year. And of course, that increased the ascertainment, along with some changes in the ICD-10 uh, data. But when you really drill down into it, as Dr. McDorman and, and uh, co-workers did that was published last year in the uh, in obstetrics and gynecology, you realize, uh, wait a second, they're really, even though some of this uh, may be artifactual just from ascertainment bias, the reality is there really is an increasing uh, trend there. And similarly, when you, you, when you look and compare the United States results, as noted in the black line here, you realize the rest of the world is still lowering their maternal mortality ratio while, while ours is uh, increasing. So something is, it appears to be going on. If you graph this out in, in the world map, uh, as we did a few minutes ago, by looking at uh, maternal mortality as a whole, now you get quite a different picture. You see that much of the world has improved or lessened their maternal mortality rate as noted by the blue and the green. And unfortunately in, um, in North America, uh, primarily in the United States, our uh, rates have increased. Uh, Canada is about the same, uh, South Africa and uh, areas down there have, have uh, increased as well. So, the, the bottom line is, is that something uh, appears to be going on. And so when you compare us to other countries, what you begin to see is all of a sudden the United States, uh, obviously very developed uh, nation, uh, begins to look like uh, someone who doesn't have quite the healthcare facilities and network uh, that we do. Uh, and this just, for example, uh, you can see that uh, the rates are uh, somewhere in between Chile and Mexico. And interestingly enough, some of the states, um, such as Texas, are actually uh, pushing above 30, which would put it very similar to uh, Mexico and some very poorly developed uh, healthcare systems. Um, now, let me put this in perspective, because again, I think when we talk per 100,000, it's, it's very easy to say, well, gosh, that's not that many deaths in total. But let's compare the per 100,000 rate to some notable diseases. So um, this graph uh, demonstrates in the general population the death per 100,000 adults. And what you see, of course, is heart disease and cancer are the two big leaders, which I don't think surprise anybody. And those are, you know, 170 per 100,000, et cetera. But really, when you get up into the 30s, your, your death rate during pregnancy is similar to what people die of strokes and unintentional injuries and chronic uh, lower respiratory diseases, uh, uh, COPD, et cetera. So, and far exceed uh, uh, diseases like diabetes and kidney disease and, and suicide. So I, I think when we look at it and look at our population of pregnant women to tell them they have the same risk of uh, dying for, as, as these major diseases, I, I think it really puts in perspective the, the problem that we have. And it's really just the tip of the iceberg. The other thing is, for, for every mother that dies, you have a lot of bad things that happen to folks. This study out of New York City, where they analyzed their maternal deaths and things of that nature, found that for every maternal death, there were 362 severe maternal morbidity events, things like getting admitted to the ICU, uh, having severe respiratory distress, requiring a transfusion. And so the things that we're seeing uh, with the rise in maternal mortality also suggests that maternal morbidity, uh, uh, severe maternal morbidity is going up. And this data from the CDC points that out where you can see uh, almost a four to five fold increased risk of blood transfusion from the 90s to, to up to 2014 and other and, it, and while the it's it's harder to see on the graph because of the relative size 
Um, other things uh, such as acute renal failure or severe uh, respiratory distress, et cetera, these things that are demonstrated in the green line are also uh, show a several fold uh, increased risk. So what's causing this rise? What, what's different now than what we saw in the mid 1990s? What, what are we doing different or is it uh, something from a demographic, from patient standpoint? Well, to answer that question, first you have to go back and ask, why do people die uh, in, in pregnancy related deaths? Well, here's the list by Dr. Berg that was published uh, now over a decade ago, but similar analyses, and I'll share with you some of our California data in a bit, uh, but sort of back this up and you see things like uh, cardiomyopathy or cardiovascular disease, uh, hemorrhage, uh, hypertension, uh, emboli and infection. And, and in some degree of order, those are the culprits that, that go on. So why, if these are the things that women die of, why, why are we seeing these in increased uh, frequency? Well, it turns out if you ask most experts, what's different about women uh, that we care for today? What are we seeing in risk factors? Well, we know mothers are, are, are older. Uh, the uh, women over 35 and, and, and specifically women over 40 having babies is the fastest growing groups of patients that we see. And similarly, we see more maternal obesity. Um, and so it's not unusual uh, for uh, hospitals and delivery uh, units to see moms that have BMIs over 35, 40, and in some cases over uh, 50. So clearly, these mothers um, are, are at more risk and have less reserve uh, than others. But the, the other big three item is the number of current C-sections and prior C-sections that we see. And uh, this increasing exponential rate, our cesarean section rate has gone up from low single digits in the 1970s to today where the, the, the United States average is over 30. And, and, and when we say number of C-sections, we see more importantly in a similar fashion, we see more prior cesarean sections. And I'll explain why that's a big deal in a bit. Now, if you analyze cesarean section, you don't want to forget that it can be life-saving. And if you look at, this is an interesting study that was published in JAMA a few years ago, um, which pointed out, if, if you look in the underdeveloped areas where cesarean section is not readily available, clearly maternal mortality ratios are higher. So if you go, for example, as, as if you remember on the graph, the sub-Saharan, uh, Africa, what you see is very high rates of maternal uh, mortality. And clearly, by not having timely and safe cesarean section, that's an issue. But what these researchers also found when they plotted out all these points on the graph are different countries and their cesarean section rate uh, uh, plotted out. What you begin to notice is, and what the conclusion of the study was, once you had a cesarean section rate over 19%, you didn't see any benefit to the mother. And similar studies have been done to babies as well. You just don't see an improved outcome. And in some studies, you actually see, uh, it, again, if you drill down to that flat part of the curve, you begin to see an increase in maternal um, mor morbidity and mortality. So if we look at that, um, uh, and put all this together, uh, while we think cesarean's a safe thing, and I think in most mothers' minds and in most uh, uh, obstetricians and midwives, it's, it's thought to be fairly safe uh, in a modern setting. Is that real? And I, I stole this cartoon from the internet, and I love the guy standing on the, all, all this stuff piled up to put his safety sign uh, up on the wall. But I think it points out some things. So first of all, 
are they correlated? So um, what I did is side by side, here's, and again, these are uh, uh, not precise year ranges, but I think you get the idea. Uh, we know in the United States, the highest cesarean section rate, and this trend continues, is in the southeastern part of the country and, and east coast uh, versus the further north and the further west you get, uh, it tends to go down. And look in, on the graph on the right uh, from the Preeclampsia Foundation, they found the maternal mortality rates are in a similar pattern. Now, obviously, you drill down state by state, there's a bit of variance, and you'd expect that in, in these type numbers. But you begin to see a general trend when you, when you look at it on a geographical basis. And when states drill down, as we did here in California, when our uh, 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 mortality review committee analyzed it, you begin to see that there is this correlation between mothers dying and delivering uh, via cesarean section. Now, did the cesarean section it cause the death uh, directly, or uh, was it something the cesarean section was done uh, for? And that that's the great debate. But the reality is there is a strong correlation, again, that gives us an idea. When you look at uh, what complications happen to women that have cesarean section versus vaginal delivery, it's a pretty straightforward list. Common complications include things like infection, uh, bleeding, uh, wound uh, dehiscence and breakdown, bladder infections, bowel problems, things of that nature. And if you look at the unusual things, in higher incidence, you see things like hysterectomy and uh, embolism and uh, bowel damage and, and other things that frankly are pretty serious when they happen. But what it turns out is if you compare a uh, cesarean first time uh, to a, a vaginal delivery first time, the incidence or the difference of these things is not uh, really that, quite that different. However, what we realize is when you have one C-section, you're likely to have another. What we know is in the United States that if you have that first C-section, there's a 90% chance or greater that you will have C-sections in your subsequent delivery. So that when we do that first C-section, we should not be just comparing what's the risk of, of the surgery today versus a vaginal delivery today. It's what's the compounded risk? What is going to happen in subsequent pregnancies and piling on? And I think that's sort of been the aha moment for us. Um, it, when we compare the two outcomes, we have to compare what we're doing to that woman's uh, health down the line. And I think as we begin to, to, to weigh that in, then it becomes pretty clear that C-sections not such a safe choice, uh, you know, for the mom's lifetime risk. Now, the data that supports this is not new. This study that was um, actually European data noted that if you looked uh, at moms during their second pregnancy and compared uh, mothers who had had a C-section the first delivery versus vaginal delivery you can see that the relative risk of some pretty bad things uh, is definitely higher for cesarean sections. So things, for example, uh, uterine rupture obviously is, is the obvious one at, 40 at 42 times the risk, but thromboembolism, which obviously can be uh, life-threatening, is almost three times more common, and things like hysterectomy six times more common. And, and, and uh, uh, other data has supported this. Um, these numbers come from uh, uh, a study that Anna Gallian and I did out of the, the Saddleback data. And again, we compared relative risk of some pretty uh, substantial things like uh, placenta previa and suspected rupture and uh, things. And just as the European data had shown, 
uh, we could show that there was a definite uh, several fold increase uh, risk in, in uh, things of that nature. So what's the main factor in that? Well, it turns out probably the biggest thing you can point to with all of this is, is abnormal placentation. Uh, it's uh, because the uterine scar uh, is in the lower segment, you tend to see placenta previa where the uh, placenta is overlying the cervix uh, more frequently. And you also see uh, what we call placenta accreta. Normally, as shown in the diagram in the middle there, normally there is a layer of tissue uh, that, that we call the decidua that lines the uterus between the placenta or afterbirth and the uterine wall so that when you go to do a delivery, the placenta after uh, the baby's delivered will just peel off the wall of the uterus. Unfortunately, because of the scarring, uh, in early placental development uh, in, the, in the uterine wall, what we uh, see on an increased percentage of patients who had had C-section, and, and I might add this is true of any uh, uterine surgery where the, the lining's been disrupted, you lose that layer in a certain percentage of patients. So when you go to deliver that patient, you cannot remove that placenta uh, easily. And there's actually higher degrees of that all the way up to what we call percreta, where the placenta actually grows completely through the wall of the uterus and into structures like the bladder or the big blood vessels that are adjacent to the uterus. So you can imagine this presents the surgeon with quite the challenge. And today, uh, we actually have medical centers that call themselves a creta center. Uh, that specialize and focus on these things. Now, the net result is the only way you can deliver this patient and stop the bleeding in, in many, many cases is to remove the uterus. And what studies have shown uh, is you're seeing an increasing rise in these uh, accretas and, and a subsequent increased rise in uh, 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 hysterect cesarean hysterectomy where we're having to remove the uterus. Um, these data that were published by Dr. Wu et al. show the 20-year rise in, uh, uh, in uh, placenta accreta and, and other evidence that I'll share with you shows that this continues, this rise is continuing past. Now, why is that so? Has that been documented that number of C-sections correlate to all of this stuff? Absolutely. This study by Steve Clark was published in 1985. A subsequent study uh, by Dr. Silver and the, and the researchers in the uh, maternal fetal network uh, some 20 years later would essentially confirm Clark's data was from USC in a single institution. Uh, Silver study would subsequently confirm that in multiple institutions. And you can see this exponential rise in placenta previa based on the number of C-sections. So that by the time you got to four and above, um, you're talking over 10% of patients, one in 10 patients will have a placenta previa. And of those patients, if there's a previa, um, seven, uh, almost 70% of them will have a accreta. And so when you begin to get up there, uh, again, this exponential rise in risk, what you begin to see is these become extremely, extremely uh, uh, risky patients. Now, other, other parts of the world are noticing the same thing. Here's uh, this Higgins data from the European Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, also noted that the frequency of accreta is, is steadily rising with the C-section rate. Uh, and then it began to double, uh, as you saw, patients with previous C-section uh, scars. And uh, again, uh, so, you know, pointing out this correlation between that. Um, uh, Vanden Acre and all also uh, 
showed this and showed the worldwide review of peripartum uh, uh, hysterectomies uh, and uh, showed obviously placental pathology made up a huge percentage of those 38 uh, percent uterine rupture made up uh, 26 percent so if you combine it about two-thirds or so of, uh, of hysterectomies were being done for something that primarily relates to having a prior cesarean sections and you can see that boiled out in his odds ratio, where if you were having a, a C-section, the odds ratio of needing a cesarean hysterectomy was 11 times, and if you'd had a previous C-section, it was seven and a half times. The, and these are not, uh, these are not uh, uh, benign things. The average blood loss was 3.7 liters, and for those obviously not uh, it's not a number, obviously, I would expect a lot of folks to know. The total blood volume of a maternal, of a mom at term is about, is about five or six liters. So over half of the mom's blood volume gets lost during the average procedure. And, and of course, some of these, it's, it's much um, more than that. Now, what was the mortality? The mortality that, that, um, those workers found overall was that about five out of a hundred mothers who had to have a hysterectomy um, passed away. Now, obviously, that was worse in poorer settings uh, where it was almost 12 per hundred versus in uh, richer settings such as the developed uh, Europe and North America, um, two and a half per hundred. But even in those settings, this became a, a life-threatening situation. And again, not only is it moms dying, you see some really horrible things. And these data, again, from the CDC, uh, acute renal failure, 369% increase. Blood transfusion, 363%. Uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome, 100 um, again, just to back up, what we're seeing in, in these patients are this massive, uh, massive increased risk. And I always love this comment from Dr. Chandler. I wish I had said it. He's a surgeon. And he said, you know, medicine used to be simple, ineffective, and relatively safe. Now it's complex, effective, and potentially dangerous. And what it reminds us is, is that when we do a life-saving procedure like cesarean section, we have to realize that, that our actions could potentially be dangerous. Now, can we do anything about it is obviously the question. Well, the simple answer is yes. First of all, if you look at cesarean section rates, and this is our data from California uh, from 251 hospitals, and what you see is the rate, the range of C-sections is 15.6 to up to 75%. Uh, now, obviously, some of those with very high or low numbers, and maybe that's skewing it. But you see this wide range of differences uh, in, in, between hospital and hospital. And while people always say, but wait a second, my hospital only takes care of high-risk patients, the truth of the matter is when you really analyze the data, it's that's not uh, the case. Now, when we in uh, quality improvement see such variation, that's actually good news because what it means is we can improve it. There are things that folks are doing on the left side of this curve that the people on the right side of this curve could be doing and lower their uh, cesarean section rate. And that's why we put together uh, both at the national level, the, the uh, safety bundle that um, had a list of things that we can do, and, and we'll be put, putting uh, many of these in, in our apps. Um, there also has been a very uh, detailed, uh, we uh, had a project where we put together a very detailed toolkit that we're now implementing in California and it's been widely downloaded in many parts of the world uh, that people are using. And as we run our collaboratives, as we get hospitals to do these things, we're always learning and improving. And so there's a lot of things 
where you can see again that hospitals can lower their C-section rates. And we're seeing a lot of success uh, in many of our uh, hospitals. So what's the conclusion? Well, first of all, I want to remind everybody, this is an international problem. And unfortunately, if we go back to that uh, hysterectomy data, uh, not only is it an international problem that everybody's increasing their C-section rate, it's one thing to do it in North America and Europe. It's another to do it in, in countries where they don't have the support. So maternal mortality is gonna be even worse uh, from this because they simply don't have the infrastructure uh, to deal with these patients. So we have to keep that in mind. So again, this rising maternal mortality is a worldwide issue. Um, unfortunately, C-section and its compounded long-term risk is probably contributing to this. And therefore, the long-term reduction of maternal mortality and morbidity will require that we work together to reduce unnecessary cesarean sections. Um, efforts have started and people are working on it, but we need new research, we need new strategies, and we need new technologies to help us with this. Because again, this is a serious problem that's going to require a serious answer. So I know Ariana was very worried about me leaving time for questions, but I think I did. So uh, Ariana, I'll turn it back over to you to, to, to lead that or uh, help organize. Of course, thank you. You were so concise. You actually ended four minutes early, so I appreciate um, your attention to the time. Um, so yes, we have the next, um, I guess, 19 minutes for questions. Um, and first, I just I want to thank you so much, Dr. LeGru, for for giving such a great overview and um, giving us kind of an international perspective as well. So thank you again. It was a, a brilliant presentation. Um, did you have a question? Um, this is Rima Shivi, the director of development at the foundation. Um, I was it's, it's funny, but I was going to just. Uh, put a posting on Facebook regarding this issue and the fact that we, we have a very high rate in California. And I was wondering whether we can use some of these slides because I need to show that it's on the rise, that mostly to make it simple, it has to do with the rise of C-section, among other things, and that, yes, we could do something about it. So can we, uh, how can we act this? Absolutely. Obviously, I'll leave it up to you with some of the legal stuff about what you can post and not post. But yeah, I mean, most of what I shared with you, I think, is is published literature. And, and you know, as I think, Arianna, right in the patient safety movement, we're all about sharing stuff. So absolutely, feel free on, on my part to, to do this. And I think one of the critical factors going forward to, to facing maternal mortality. I don't want to scare women that are pregnant. Um, I, you know, I mean, that's never a good thing, but I do think that, that women need to be informed about this. And I, I think one of the problems is that I said earlier is that um, patients, unfortunately, if, if you just ask somebody off the street, hey, isn't it safer to have a C-section than a vaginal delivery? Um, first of all, they're, they're mostly thinking about their baby. And again, that's a lecture in itself, but there, there is some downside risk. And, you know, um, but I think as far as their well-being, they don't appreciate the compounded risk. And there's been some wonderful work by the Creta Foundation and uh, other people in the area that are trying to get this message across about the compounded, you know, subsequent risk to, to people down the way. But uh, unfortunately, it's just not out there in, in the public yet. Yeah. And then just to close the loop on that. So the presentation itself, as well as the audio recording um, of this webinar are posted for all of our quarterly webinars on our website so they can be accessed by anyone after and I will um, make sure to share the link with people who may not have been able to join today. Um, but Dr. LeGru, I did have a question. So that that was, you know, I was wondering if you had any strategies kind of um, dovetailing off of what Rima asked and what you had, how you had responded was, you know, how do you position this 
to you know consumers of healthcare to women to their families without scaring them. Um, it, it's you know obviously a you have hormonal women who are very you know want to make sure that they're taking care of themselves and their babies, but um, you know how do you position that? Are there tools that are accessible um, that hospitals use to to help with those conversations? Yeah, I, I think it starts with, with patient education and putting it in a realistic pose. Um, I think one good news uh, about all this stuff is, and, and I, you know, again, I, I painted a pretty scary picture. I understand that. But if, if we know it's coming and we prepare for it, there's a huge, you know, these are things that you do see better outcomes. And, and some, as you know, some of our work on hemorrhage and, and other uh, uh, of, of the safety measures point out, if we're prepared and we're ready and have the right people there to take care of it, we can mitigate a lot of this uh, uh, morbidity as well as mortality. So I think being prepared, and, and that's why it's important to let people know. But it, again, I, I think that, I, I, you know, it, it is, it's a very, um, and, and I can tell you this from experience in, in my career where, where I had to deal with a lot of these uh, type, types of conversations with patients, very fine line between scaring somebody into something or out of something and uh, educating them on the real risk and benefits. And I think, I think we as uh, providers, I know we, we try to work some of this into the toolkit to give people better ways uh, to educate uh, and, and not, not, you know, and fairly let there be shared decision making uh, without over o overdoing it, so to speak. But again, I, I would say that unfortunately in this issue, the, the, the knowledge deficit is really more about uh, people don't understand that there are these downside risks. Mm -hmm. uh May I ask you something? Uh, we need to get to the root cause of the problem in, in, or situation in, 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 I mean, in any situation. So what has been done with the OBGYNs and the physicians who basically say, let's do a C-section? And that's why we have C-sections on the rise. And this, is, this question is from a lay person who knows nothing about this until I came across this indicator on the website on our website i'm like oh my god in california it's higher than i thought it is so what is being done with the physicians who are saying you need a c-section and i hate to get the insurance companies involved do we need also to educate them that hey if somebody's having a c-section you need to let your member think twice about this yeah, well, the the short answer is there's no short answer, but um, the the realistic answer is there are obviously clinical things we can do. Um, a lot of what we do in the toolkit and we'll be doing in the apps is sort of, sort of trying to get people to do uh, what we call shorter, easier, and more effective, and therefore more safe. Uh, delivery techniques, um, things like not admitting people who are not in labor, uh, things like doing better jobs of ripening the cervix before labor uh, uh, so that we don't end up with these 36-hour labors that end up uh, requiring a C-section. Uh, so there's clinical things we can do, um, but again, there, there's a lot outside of uh, what we can as clinicians control. And I, I would get into payment reform. Uh, I do know that uh, there, there are uh, strong uh, discussions going on amongst all the payers about uh, not rewarding uh, uh, C-sections, so to speak, um, which is hard to do because it's not just about the dollars, as you mentioned. It's, you know, I, I can spend as a doctor, uh, you know, 45 minutes in the operating room or I can, you know, go through this, uh, you, you know, 12, 18 hour labor with the patient and, and uh, things of that nature. And so it's not just that. So there are some practice changes and some other things. And then, and then I would say there, there's things like uh, tort reform. 
Um, yeah, unfortunately, the, there's a paper, it's very old, but it's probably still true, where you're 10 times more likely to get sued for not having done uh, a, a C-section than you are of doing one. And as long as that's the perception by doctors, it obviously pushes them uh, uh, towards that. So again, I, th I think there's a, a zillion things and uh, that's why I, the toolkit is so long. <laughs> but, um, you know, the bottom line is there's lots of things we can do to help. Great. So the other question, uh, if, if I need you to come and speak to various groups of yeah. women, how? Yeah, he's, he's in our network. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Ariana, yeah. I'll make me. Go ahead, Dr. LeGrew. No, I was going to say you'll make me, so that, that's yeah. easy. Yeah, since Dr. LeGrew is local and is our chair of the OB safety group, he's available. Uh, so I want to open up to the rest of the people who are on the line. We still have about uh, 10 minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Make sure that you take yourself off a of mute. No questions, comments, feedback? <laughs> oh, great. Um, okay, Claire uh, Mana from HQI has a question, but she's on mute. So she, I think, is going to type it out. Uh, so we'll read it to Dr. LaGrue, Claire. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Claire. Hi. Okay, good. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I'm um, struggling with a, a cold and sore throat. So hope, I uh, hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for putting this webinar on and thank you for your time, Dr. LaGrue. Um, I wanted to ask you about the toolkit because what we find with a lot of hospitals is um, the staff have read it and they are aware of it. They know that it exists and there seems to be a gap between the knowledge and implementing the toolkit in their hospitals. <clears throat> so there's, there's a science to implementing any toolkit, I think. And what has been some of the steps that you've taken in your own experiences to to get things like the toolkit up and running or spreading the information around in, in your facility? Because I know that, that some hospitals in California are struggling with that. Yeah, I, I, great question, Claire, because I, I think compared to some of the other safety toolkits and things of that nature we put in, uh, you know, C-section reduction is not a, a overnight thing. And it really takes first changing the culture and, and getting, uh, you know, providers to understand uh, the importance of it, um, it as well as obviously uh, patients and, and other groups uh, uh, involved in all this. But I, I think, first of all, we set the expectation that uh, this is not, first of all, going to be something you're going to be able to do in a few months. This is going to take uh, a year, two years, three years to, to really get uh, firm control. And then it's going to be something that people have to work with chronically. We, we need to make, we need to bake these changes in and make it, uh, you know, a cultural thing. So I think setting those expectations are important. I, I do think the good news is oftentimes, uh, uh, we can analyze why we're doing, uh, the C-sections in the first place in our institution, so to speak. In other words, you can do uh, either here in California, many of the hospitals, as you know, can, can look in the maternal data center and they can get an idea of things they need to work on. Is it failure to progress? Uh, is it inductions? Is it uh, uh, overreading of, of, you know, uh, fetal heart rate strips and, and C-section for fetal concern. So you can get a direction that it's, it's hey, these are the things that might be most helpful and bring our rates down, uh, 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 you know, quickly. And then lastly, I think the big tip I, that I'm telling everybody, every, every time I give this talk into a hospital or 
is transparency, transparency, transparency. And I, I am a huge believer that we as uh, caregivers have no right to hide C-section rates from anybody. And I, I think we have to be open about, you know, what we're doing. And I, I think, you know, I, I, because just as I showed you the variation between the hospitals, um, you know, obviously the, the hospital the patient chooses can make an enormous difference in their C-section risk. But then the other, the other part of it is when you drill down within the hospital, you see that kind of variation provider to provider. So I think patients can have that conversation when they walk in for their, for their uh, first visit or perhaps their, their uh, getting to know visit, whatever you want to call it, where they, where they really have that conversation with the provider, what your C-section rate is and, and why is it that way? And, Again, I realize that takes some education and some sophistication, but I, I just think it's very hard. Uh, we, we know we have providers the, the same way, obviously, as showed you the hospitals that, you know, if it's your first pregnancy, you have a, you know, you have a 75% chance of getting a C-section versus we have providers where it's, you know, uh, 10, 15 percent. So, so I think, I think again, transparency is a huge deal too. Yeah, yeah, we're we're huge advocates of that too. And the um, NTSV C-section rate, the episiotomy, breastfeeding, and VBAC rates will be published uh, next year in January. So those will be public again. So thank yeah. you, appreciate it. Cool, Great. thank you. Get better. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Any other questions out there? We still have about four minutes. Um, this is Claire again. Yeah, I will ask another question if no one else is. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I read somewhere or heard it on NPR about um, uh, in North Carolina, there is a huge disparity between uh, deaths among uh, African American and, and Caucasian women. And they were able to close the maternal death rate. Um, they were able to close that gap between the, that disparity by implementing, I believe it was like a pregnancy medical home. And it was geared for Medicaid patients. Do you think, are you familiar with that model? And is that something you know, that I, I, I have read a bit on that, but, but I don't want to claim expertise on that. I, I think the the more general point is yes. I, I think uh, you know as you know we have the same disparity here in California and, and uh, you know throughout the country and my suspicion is throughout the world and how we care for those patients and how closely we watch them. I, I think it's interesting. I think if a 45 year old woman comes in anybody's office, they're aware that that woman's at an increased risk and they're going to you know check and double check and, and make sure uh, that, you know, they know a 45-year-old woman having a baby compared to a 25-year-old woman it is, is different. On the other hand, I think we need to do the same thing in uh, classifying in whether it's race or, uh, you know, obviously socioeconomic factors that are in increased risk. And I, I just think we need to, again, I, Obviously, uh, be careful not to, to separate out care for patients and because everybody deserves good care. But clearly, there are populations, like you say, of folks that, that need special attention. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Any last questions in the last two minutes? Okay, well, I'm going to um, take silence as a good sign. And um, Dr. LeGrew, thank you again so much for your leadership and leading us through this super important issue. Um, for those of you who are still on the phone or are listening to us later as a recording, um, we will have a reducing unnecessary C-sections panel at our upcoming World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit 
February 23rd through the 25th in London. Um, Dr. David LeGrew is moderating that panel and uh, we're really excited to have that as one of our focuses. So um, keep, uh, keep checking our website and feel free to participate and, and come along with us to London. So thanks again, everyone, and we will uh, update you on our agenda for quarterly webinars in early 2018 with uh, which topics we'll be focusing on next year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.